All right, good afternoon, everybody. Looks like we got good quorum today. And recording is working. So thanks, everybody, for, for joining in today. Uh, we have, uh, I think, a repeat speaker. I, I'm pretty sure Brian has given a talk before, probably on one of uh, his other projects. But this is uh, one of the new ones that uh, just got funded, I think, in the last round of CC Star. Uh, and Brian is going to be talking a little bit about Pelican. And I will turn it over to Brian to give us a good talk. You know, it, I, it certainly might be a uh, repeat speaker, but it's been long enough I don't remember what it was about. Uh, the good news is uh, looking here at the list of participants, there's a, uh, a good number of folks that I, I know. So uh, I, I, it's a, definitely a crowd I enjoy. Um, so I'm Brian Bachman. Uh I am the, the PI of the bigger project uh, I'll talk about today, but I'm not going to uh, just give the sales pitch. I'll, I'll embed a little bit of the sales pitch, but I, I want to talk a little bit about how we approach distributed computing in general. So I'll, I'll meander in and out of the, uh, of the lines. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, so I'm uh, a investigator at the, the Mortgage Institute for Research, which is a, a private research institution smack dab in the UW-Madison campus. So if you uh, say I'm from, from Madison uh, or, or UW, you won't entirely be wrong. Uh, so uh, I, I even think I see a good number of uh, my colleagues and friends here from, from Madison. Um, I've I've been uh, here for five years, and uh, before that, I was at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Uh, and it turns out, uh, uh, working on distributed computing then and now, and, and hopefully on into the future. Uh, the real uh, angle I want to talk about today, and and how I want to approach things, is really thinking about data sets uh, as the, the lifeblood of science. Uh, uh, even, even if you are uh, simulating data from a, a random number generator, you still have to seed that random number generator. Uh, but in general, uh, almost anything that you're doing within uh, scientific research is going to have some sort of input data. So without, uh, without those data sets, uh, what were the it doesn't matter how clever your algorithms are. It doesn't matter how good, great your insight is or your intuition. Uh, you are going to need to do data sets to move your science forward. Uh, and as we've seen over and over again to, to utilize these, uh, you're going to need to be able to connect to a, a broad set of computing types and, and capacity. So uh, there was a while that it seemed like every Every few weeks, I was meeting a new researcher that was uh, making that transition from Excel spreadsheets to uh, larger scale computing. But for the most part, a lot of those transitions have been done and, and really need people are starting to think larger and larger in how they want to uh, use computing to go over their, their data sets. Uh, engineering that effective connection uh, is really an immense and difficult problem. Uh, you have issues in infrastructure. Um, uh, data sets are often located in repositories that are built for curation, built for archival, uh, which is really a different design point. Uh, you know, maybe only sharing the fact that there's storage devices somewhere uh, than what you need for data sets that are meant to be uh, analyzed at large scale. Uh, in fact, the, on the software side, you really have a inherently distributed problem. Uh, uh, whether you look at institutions, uh, whether you look at funding agencies or journals or whatever the source of the data sets are, uh, really uh, often the, the computing is at a different location. So uh, if you have, you know, at least in my view, a, a distributed computing point of view of the world, uh, you're a step ahead because this is kind of how we've ended up with it in our landscape. Uh, so uh, to, to tackle some of these challenges, uh, we've been working uh, over quite a while to trace back all the roots uh, on what we're calling the Open Science Data Federations and the or Data Federation. 
And the, the goal of the, the OSDF is to uh, federate together all data set repositories uh, for all of open science. Uh, so again, where, where is this tough? Uh, you need a broad set of clients. Uh, uh, not everybody uses POSIX, not everybody, uh, when they say compute, they even mean a, a, a terminal. They might mean browser integration. They might need Python integration. They might need specific Python libraries or machine learning frameworks that they're integrating with. Uh, if they're, you know, if you want to attract your diverse set of users, you're really going to need to have a diverse set of clients. And again, going back to this inherently distributed part of the, the problem, you need a scalable infrastructure uh, to feed the thousands of jobs or users or uh, the, the training uh, room full of Jupyter notebooks uh, that might want the, the objects in your data set. So uh, our insight or our belief within the OSDF is these are, you know, while these might be uh, difficult challenges, uh, that they're common across uh, many of the different data set repository types. So uh, we believe uh, in building a, a shared infrastructure uh, uh, as opposed to uh, doing this uh, over and over for each repository. Uh, hopefully that uh, ideology uh, rings true for this crowd. Uh, it's the same thing as networks. Uh, very, very, very rarely do you have a network for a specific science or a specific repository. And uh, in the end, networks are in the business of uh, common infrastructure for science. So uh, again, the, the solution uh, that we're putting together and have been putting together for this is called the OSDF. And when I try to boil it down into a sentence, I like to say it's a federated platform. Uh, for delivering data sets from repositories to compute in an effective, scalable manner. Um, and, and while I continue to workshop uh, this uh, this description, one thing that I always get as feedback is, what do I mean as compute? And, and I have to admit, I, I uh, try to put a whole lot of stuff in this umbrella. So we are thinking about how do we uh, deliver to large national scale resources? How do we deliver to distributed pools of resources where there might be medium-sized chunks all across the nation? Uh, I mean, uh, browsers, laptops, anywhere where people might be util want to utilize data sets, we want to uh, help move it towards them. Uh, so the OSDF, uh, in my envisioning of it, uh, provides a, a adapter plug uh, that takes whatever repository you're working with and, and connects your science uh, to the national and international cyber infrastructure. So to uh, call out some pieces of this particular puzzle, uh, this uh, service is part of the OSU Consortium's fabric of services. Uh, the operations, the, the people who uh, we tend to use Kubernetes who are often creating pods and debugging containers uh, are part of the PATH project. Uh, a lot of the hardware is owned by uh, the NRP. And looking at this guest list, I think I will also shout out to both uh, Internet2 and ESNet, who uh, in some cases owns, in some cases uh, sites and helps operate at points of presence, uh, additional hardware as part of this infrastructure. Uh, I zoom out, have to zoom out quite far for this map. Uh, uh, but we're at uh, about uh, a dozen or so uh, data set repositories. And then to help with the common infra distribution infrastructure, we have about two dozen caches located uh, nationally and across the world. Um, at some point, I'm going to talk ice cubed, putting something in the South Pole just so I can have a, a map that doesn't render well in, in Google Maps. Uh, again, OSDF uh, isn't a new service. Uh, you've probably seen this in prior presentations, uh, maybe uh, Frank Worthwine uh, more than myself. Uh, if you are a CC star awardee, you might have noticed the, the reference in the CC star solicitation. Uh, but what we've been doing recently is kind of splitting it in two. Uh, so before we kind of put everything, software, services, containers, it all was called OSDF. 
and we're trying to do a, a good job about splitting it out uh, into uh, thinking about the what's the software and what's the service. So uh, the service or the software we took out, uh, bundled together, and, and that's what we're christening the, the Pelkin platform. And as you imagine, the Pelkin project supports this. Uh, it's the same software components as before, and uh, you know maybe moving it together in a, a more coherent direction. And then the instance of the um, uh, of the Pelican platform that's found across the nation is is the OSDF. Uh, it's probably you know uh, one of the other things that our team puts together is Condor. You know, similarly, we have uh, uh, flagship Condor pools uh, like the CMS Global Pool, and that's separate from the uh, HT Condor software suite itself. So uh, again, the Pelican project uh, for this software is uh, newly funded. We we are in month five. Uh, it's a little scary. We've officially passed through the 10% done mark. Uh, and it's a, a pretty uh, good sized project as far as NSF goes. It's four, four years long. And I like to think of it as, as having three goals, uh, strengthening, strengthening and advancing the, the OSDF. And we'll have some fun picking apart some of the technical details and what I mean there. Uh, it's about expanding the types of computing where OSTF is impactful. Uh, so I'll spend quite a bit of time about how we grew up from distributed high throughput computing, but this is one opportunity to to be able to make impacts in more places and uh, expand the, the science user communities. Uh, in, in particular, uh, one of the drivers for this project is uh, the climate community, and I've been uh, making some good new friends at NCAR in Colorado. So uh, again, to uh, to go back to one of the places we started uh, is is the OS pool. Uh, so uh, when I try to explain of what we are aiming to accomplish on the OS pool, uh, you have to have a maybe good feel for the difference between high performance and high throughput computing. Uh, now, being a, a old school CS person myself, uh, uh, obviously the way I usually explain this is with a car analogy. So I, I like to say the high performance computing is the Ferrari, and I uh, enjoy high throughput computing being the dump truck. Uh, another way to think about your computing, uh, you know, I like to boil everything down to uh, f of x to y. So. Uh, high performance computing uh, might be to uh, take your X, your input data set, uh, and try to execute your transformation or your analysis F as fast as you can in order to produce Y. And uh, you know, a lot of times the focus is how quickly can I get it done? Uh, can I get this insight and turn around and do science faster? Uh, and, and then the contrast with high throughput computing is uh, maybe more focused on doing many, many calculations, so large ensembles of jobs. Uh, maybe you're training uh, a huge number of uh, hyperparameters uh, in machine learning. Maybe you're simulating data, but uh, the types of problems that are amenable uh, to instead of trying to make things go as fast as you can on a large amount of resources, but rather to, to maximize your, your overall throughput for your a uh, large ensemble of tasks. So uh, whether you like uh, uh, the car analogy or the mathematical formulation, you know, high throughput computing is trying to get as much science done as, as possible. Uh, for us, the, the way we do that is through a batch computing interface. Uh, uh, looking again on the names of the list, uh, lots of you are familiar with these. Uh, so when I explain it uh, to, to students, I say, you know, you want uh, to pair a list of all the things you want to accomplish, all the F, Fs, Xs, and Ys, uh, and you think of each of those tuples as a job on your to-do list. Uh, often uh, you want to arrange some sort of dependencies between the jobs, uh, and, and those form a, a DAG. And the terminology we use is that uh, if you take that list of work and you want to uh, 
delegate it to a system that you place it at your your access point where you interact with the overall system and then all the the different places within the, the ecosystem where you uh, execute uh, they actually do that f of x and store it to y and maybe move it backwards or back uh, towards something uh, we think of that as your your execution point so uh, this is our uh, probably the most simplified view of the world we can of how we approach high throughput computing. And I like to remind folks that, uh, you know, if you're out shopping and you have 10 items on your to-do list, um, you know, any way that you you uh, keep your shopping list is probably gonna be fine. You could write it on your hand, you could keep it in a little notebook. Uh, but then if you instead have not 10 items, uh, 10 million items, uh, you're going to want uh, something more elaborate than your your typical shopping list. And uh, similarly, high throughput computing, we've uh, worked uh, uh, at the Center for High Throughput Computing over many years uh, to develop software and services that are really tailored towards scaling and automating uh, such, such workflows. So uh, that's, uh, of course, the HT Condor software suite, uh, uh, HTCSS, and it this provides us uh, with what we use in our projects, all the, the access points where we replace the jobs, the, the execution points. Um, it manages workflows, sets of jobs for researchers, uh, federates uh, and manages compute capacity uh, and is widely widely distributed. Uh, um, and well, that's where we start building some of our uh, big services. From. So uh, again, kind of the mental picture I keep of all this is, uh, you know, if we have our happy user who knows their uh, F and their X that they want to execute, uh, like point out the first thing that they do is actually typically has to move that, which uh, when I talk to users on campus at UW, that's often the most difficult part is how do I get the data to the system? Uh, you place your jobs at your access point. Uh, the job or the access point is going to allocate some sort of resources to your workflow. And uh, then, of course, uh, beautifully uh, have PowerPoint animations that took you way, way too long to put together uh, to get this all going. The execution points uh, uh, execute your function and then start uh, uh, bringing it all back. Again, uh, never do PowerPoint uh, animations. So uh, one of the reasons I'm personally interested in this work is this sort of style of high throughput computing and having all the tasks and the data described and managed leads really well, lends really well to widely distributed computing. Uh, so uh, if you're telling the system all about your inputs and your outputs, you can start to avoid shared file systems. Uh, shared file systems can be the death of large-scale distributed computing. And uh, then the, the system could decide, make decisions based on the descriptions and requirements about how far away or how close by to run each of your jobs. Uh, so uh, within the OSG consortium, uh, we take the these concepts, we take Condor at a large scale, and we build a resource, uh, think of it as a virtual cluster, an overlay cluster, uh, called the OS pool, or for short, the, the open science pool. Uh, and, and in this case, each of the execution points are going to be launched inside some computing environment uh, wherever we might be able to find capacity. So this might be a VM, uh, a pod, uh, a job inside another batch system. Uh, but for us, uh, uh, this open um, capacity that we want to provide through the open uh, pool also needs open data. Uh, just as a side to, to give you guys a, a feel for the scale of this, uh, any given day we have about more or less 60 institutions uh, contributing and just shy these days of about a million jobs uh, a day, about uh, uh, 50 researchers and 70 million file transfers a day uh, uh, as we execute all the different workloads right at the APs. So uh, 
again, for you, you folks in networking, uh, you probably have already identified the problem. It's great and easy to send uh, scripts about or, or input arguments, uh, but larger scale data can really become um, uh, a challenge as you work across um, uh, heterogeneous and wide area networks. Uh, so we start most users uh, at a really simple model. A Condor has some built-in uh, file handlers uh, that move data to and from uh, the AP to the EPs. Uh, these are reliable, these are simple, uh, but they can be relatively limited in scale. You know, if your access point is on a, let's say a 10 gigabit network and you're moving everything to and from the access point, you're gonna go out 10 gigabits. So Condor itself can actually delegate transfers uh, to another protocol uh, uh, through a custom plugin mechanism. And this is often how users will achieve scale on the, the OS pool. That they uh, utilize these delegated transfers to instead of moving data to and from the access point, to and from whatever data sources they might be working with. Uh, that useful because storage systems are more scalable than the access point itself. And uh, as we'll see in the OSDF, uh, if we have lots of repeated data access, which we really see a large number of times in scientific workflows, uh, you can decrease your overall WAN throughput or footprint. So in order to bring a data set or a repository into the system, we have a service that we like to call the origin uh, that I, I kind of think of as an adapter plug for bringing your, your data into the OSDF. So if you have your, your three uh, disparate repositories, maybe some large community ones like the PDB, uh, maybe something local to your institution or really even local to your lab, uh, the view is that you take that data and you, your, your, you know, it often I'll refer to as an object store uh, because we want to have a, a wide variety of sources. Uh, you put a origin service in front of it and that integrates it into the common infrastructure. So the goal is uh, by plugging in one of these origins and adapt as an adapter plug in front of your uh, storage, uh, you can now integrate with the OSDF and deliver that input data into your compute. And uh, going back to this idea of having common shared infrastructure, you know, often you don't want to only pull it in uh, to your compute once, uh, but you're going to be working with a lot of this over and over. And uh, by having a common cache layer for data, uh, frequent data access, we can reduce the overall load on uh, the origin repository and uh, hopefully uh, address some of the mismatch between what the origin can do and how much computing power you have. So our overall vision is before the user had to start moving all their inputs and their functions to the access point, uh, but now the user hopefully only has to move the job description, uh, which moves out to the execution points, and everything else can go through this common uh, data federation infrastructure. Uh, so uh, as a kind of example science use case, one that we've had a lot of fun with uh, in uh, December, uh, the NRAO took uh, some data sets off the shelf that haven't that were selected by the Hubble team um, that were a relatively well studied piece of sky and use the distributed high throughput computing. So they use the OS pool and uh, some other resources and analyze the data and then uh, use the, the OSDF uh, to help the, deliver the data to the job. So uh, across 12 different sites, which includes everything from really big sites like uh, uh, your Wisconsin, your Nebraska's, your San Diego supercomputing centers, uh, down to really small uh, MSIs, M1 uh, universities. We're all able to uh, contribute to this one calculation. Uh, we moved about 170 terabytes over 170,000 file accesses. And in this particular problem, they had uh, that repeated uh, data analysis motif, that this is an iterative problem that goes back to the original raw data for each iteration and pulls it through the caches each time as it uh, refines the solution. 
again, another sense of scale. Uh, over the last 12 months or so, there's been about uh, uh, 64 petabytes moved, uh, 15 different collaborations, and 120 different uh, PI-led groups. Uh, it works out to be about 60 file accesses a second, which I, I really love because I think, uh, again, as an adapter plug, and somehow 60 hertz sounds uh, pretty good for an adapter plug. Uh, and then uh, everybody uh, here, uh, if you're uh, a U.S.-based researcher or collaborator, you can uh, start uh, getting your account to OS pool today and interact and work with uh, the, the OSDF if you're curious. So to peel back the onion just a little bit, uh, a little bit on the internals. Uh, so again, let's take this Condor example where we have a job running on an EP somewhere on the top of the, the screen here, and it has uh, uh, wants to access some object that's going to be on a object store. This in this case, I draw a POSIX file system uh, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, so uh, first thing it does is it's going to fire off that client, uh, which reaches out and uh, accesses uh, a manager service uh, and sends that manager service request to read the object. Uh, the client itself uh, might be our uh, uh, own bespoke CLI. Uh, the CLI we ship right now works a little bit like SCP, except for SSH or passwords. It's going to use uh, a single sign-on, uh, maybe from the institution or for CI logon. And that client's going to uh, send that request out to the director. Uh, now, one thing that uh, you know, is maybe not a dirty secret, but a, a proud secret uh, I would have for the, the OSDF is that underneath the hood, we are trying to use plain old HTTP as, as much as possible. So uh, the request uh, for the director here uh, to, to this made up file name uh, or object name uh, is just a normal HTTP uh, requests. So we provide this shiny client. Uh, if you like it, use it. If, if you don't like it, uh, Perl is also a great client. So uh, here it's the exact same uh, object before in the, the prior screenshot, except it's, it's just using plain old Perl. Uh, this is using a Git. We write into the data federation, you'd use a HTTP hook. So we've launched the client. The client reaches out and uh, uh, requests something from the manager. And the next thing that the manager needs to do is actually determine a nearby uh, service to actually serve the object. Uh, right now, this is really uh, focused on geo, geo IP location. So uh, we, we have caches for, throughout the lower 48. And again, thanks to some of the networking partners, we have good uh, we have this fun statement where we think every point in the lower 48 states is within 500 miles from a OSDF cache. Um, as an aside, uh, GOIP, it's got some upsides, it's got some downsides. This is one thing that I, I think we're going to have fun over the year to really think about how this cache selection works. Uh, but anyhow, if it's in the cache, uh, it's served to the client immediately. Uh, and uh, the direct response is going to look like this. And uh, as part of the response, it's just a normal HTTP redirect uh, going out to some location for that cache. Uh, you'll see we use some of these link metadata, which is part of a standardized RFC to let the client know about multiple caches. And this is kind of some of the, the uh, uh, syntactic sugar that we add on top of, uh, or use on top of uh, plain HTTP. But still, this is a nor otherwise a normal HTTP redirect. And I'd point out uh, that as you get redirected to the cache, uh, the cache itself, in order to handle authorization, really has to understand some sort of uh, author distributed authorization policy. Uh, it's a long talk. It's probably another talk, uh, but uh, we do that by embed or by having the client get a access token uh, from the origin or from a issuer that the the origin selects. And having that the access token be understood by the cache, so the 
uh, this way, the whatever the origin, whatever capability or access control the origin service asserts that the client's allowed to have can then be enforced uh, by the cache. So uh, for clients that actually don't have uh, the, the, the requisite token, uh, again, and some of our syntactic sugar is uh, OAuth integration. So here, this little screenshot uh, demonstrates the integration with CI Logon, where I didn't have the token loaded up for this particular part of the namespace. And so it's redirecting me to a service that does an OAuth handshake and eventually authenticates through, through CI Logon, and then in this case, UW Madison. So we try to make it as easy as the user, as the user can uh, and not have them to manage uh, by hand credentials or anything like that. In the case of a cache miss, uh, the cache will itself return to the origin and, or sorry, return to the manager and ask for an origin object. Uh, the prefix of the, the full name within the federations used to identify the correct origin or origins and uh, the data flows from the object store on upward. Uh, subsequent reads uh, then will go through the, the local cache and uh, the, your object store and origin hopefully aren't gonna be bothered again unless the cache eviction occurs. Uh, if you're not reading but writing, uh, at least right now, the writing goes directly to the origin service. Uh, so we still use the manager to uh, to locate the correct origin and to identify where we want to write to, uh, but it goes uh, straight on through. And that's, I think, going to be, again, some part of the distribution layer that we're going to be tinkering with over the next year. Uh, so again, to recap the architecture, uh, maybe the three most important services within the OSDF to, to understand. So we have an origin for exposing and, and plugging a object store uh, into the ecosystem. Uh, the origin also helps not only move data, but map uh, authorization policies from internal to the outside world. The cache service actually serves up and uh, forwards objects, uh, helping provide the scalability of the data distribution layer. And the manager is the one that kind of orchestrates the whole ecosystem uh, matching requests to corresponding services. And long-term, uh, I, I want to think of this as a transport bus, connecting a ever-increasing broad range of uh, technologies for data set repositories to ever-increasing uh, list uh, of clients. Uh, so uh, historically, before the Pelican project started, it was all POSIX file systems that we can connect to, uh, we have now support for S3 endpoints, and uh, we want to start looking at other data repositories like uh, Dataverse. On the client side, you know, we were happy to start with uh, the 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 OS uh, the OS pool and tight integration with HTCSS, uh, but we want additional resources and additional uh, access modalities. Just to acknowledge uh, where we've been. Uh, you know, I mentioned this is not a new project, but especially since I see some of the individuals in the room uh, that they, we trace a lot of history uh, through uh, NSF project called Any Data, Anytime, Anywhere uh, that dates back to 2009 between Nebraska, Wisconsin, and UCSD uh, that laid out uh, some of the original uh, ideas about data federations and uh, uh, really delivered something wonderful to the, the HEP community. Uh, but maybe was a little too highly tailored to the HEP community. Around uh, 2016, uh, the, the OSHI consortium started taking these ideas and uh, making them more broadly applicable to, to other uh, science domains. Uh, particularly, uh, we, use, we started with the, the stash file system at Chicago. A lot of you might have heard the, the old terminology of stash cache. That's where that came from. Uh, and we started really evolving uh, the technologies, uh, used more cache software, uh, switched to new authorization modalities. And then over the last couple of years have been placing more and more hardware into the network with the help of partners, 
and uh, emphasizing distribution based on Kubernetes and, and using Kubernetes for the operations. And that, uh, of course, then spawned off the, this new project. So uh, again, the project started with uh, the OS pool, and we now view that as the kind of the, the first customer, uh, still an important customer, but uh, ones that we're trying to grow beyond. Uh, we are uh, the, right now working on uh, adding a more diverse range of clients. Uh, the most important uh, uh, thing that we're doing this month is trying to get uh, integration with NCARGOing. Uh, so NCAR's research data archives host several petabytes of uh, open uh, climate data, and we want to make it as easy to analyze the, the climate data as you know maybe the LIGO researchers find to, to an, uh, analyze their uh, LIGO data. And then uh, the other integrations that we're we're really working on uh, at point out is uh, doing better within the, the Python ecosystem. So uh, within Python there's a abstract uh, or there's a base class or, or you know, a common template is the way to think of it. Uh, called FSSpec, and if you can provide a plugin for your project within this FSSpec uh, 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 abstract base class, uh, then a number of the different data science Python-based uh, uh, projects can utilize your service. So this includes things like PyTorch, uh, includes Pandas, uh, uh, you know, name your typical or favorite data science tool, and, and quite likely uh, uh, FSPEC uh, will be able to utilize it. Uh, so that includes a lot of uh, the, the climate ecosystem. Uh, so uh, as part of working with the Earth Sciences crowd, not only are we getting their data integrated to the, the OSDF, uh, but we've been trying to work well with uh, their software. So uh, it turns out because it's distributed, uh, and because Pelican and OSDF are all HTTP based, if you see, you know, the words cloud optimized anywhere, there's a good likelihood that uh, that it, it is going to work well with the OSDF. Um, so we're taking one of the tutorials uh, within the climate community from a, a particular activity called Project Pythia. And our, our goal is to uh, take the uh, original tutorial, which is going to be X-Array and ZAR uh, formatted data on top of AWS. And we're working on the same demo where we take X-Array and ZAR and put it upon uh, a Pelican Federation. And, and that means that from within Python, uh, where uh, this was the original URL uh, that uh, is used to access the data in the tutorial, uh, that you will then be able to replace this with a OSDF URL. So uh, we currently integrate and have an origin sitting in front of all of, uh, AWS's uh, open data. Uh, so you can kind of see this is the bucket and this is the object name, and you replace it with the same uh, similar prefix. Uh, so this one, it's our, the prefix for uh, AWS within uh, the OSDF, and then the same object name, or sorry, bucket and object name. So uh, users were going to end up having to uh, evoke maybe some different Python libraries and the, the headers of their, or the beginning of their scripts, but otherwise it will uh, be an identical experience. And again, to kind of focus on the, the advantages of the OSDF is once you can do this uh, with S3, we want to say, you know, integrate or fuse in a in-car data set that uh, you, you know, so you would just then need to select a different prefix within the, the data federation. So this kind of goes toward our idea of being common transport bus. Once you know how to use the OSDF in your analysis, uh, then you can go back and uh, uh, use as many different data feder or data repositories that are included in the OSDF. So uh, just to highlight a couple ideas, uh, uh, this uh, if you're sitting on a campus, uh, OSDF is there to uh, 
help researchers distribute, share, and compute on data sets in your new local campus storage, say. Um, a lot of CC star storage uh, resources are starting to integrate within the OSDF, and that's an ability to store scientific data sets on the storage in, in order to compute on the, the OS pool. Or if you're a big consumer, or, uh, or big uh, compute uh, sync in the OS pool, uh, maybe uh, you'd be interested in hosting cache local to your campus. Because of course, the caches embedded in the network help reduce the overall load on the, the wide area network. Uh, but this, a lot of these cases, caches on your local campus will reduce that uh, link between on and off campus. So just to summarize a little bit of what we're working on right now, uh, we're trying to simplify components, uh, trying to re-engineer the central services to make them simpler, more robust. Uh, we're actually doing a, maybe decoupling is the wrong word, the abstraction layer between the OSDF and other OSG services. Uh, we're hoping to, to launch a mini OSDF to kind of uh, uh, act as a place for us developers to eat our own dog food, uh, but launch it here at the UW-Madison campus uh, and make it easier to run these distributed caching services. Uh, for our second goal, uh, we're trying to add that browser-based or that Python API, the new browser-based one uh, that I didn't get time to talk about uh, and, and that uh, will allow us to integrate better with uh, machine learning frameworks such as PyTorch and uh, expand the science user communities. I mentioned NCAR already, but another big one for us is going to be the, the National Data Platform Pilot. So I'll get to the next slide. Um, for those new modalities, uh, I, I think uh, true test of a lot of projects is not how it scales up, but how it scales down. Uh, we're going to try to get out of uh, only being able to support people that are you know good command line jockeys. Uh, and part of this was our browser-based access and uh, a lot of our services are now growing web interfaces, so you don't have to only interact with them through the command line. Uh, we're trying to reach out uh, to institutions that just maybe don't have a lot of local institutional hardware uh, by uh, putting together some uh, storage allocations that, that we can provide on behalf of the researchers. And um, you know, overall, I'm a big fan of, of thinking about FAIR uh, uh, and, and and thinking that effective data access and equitable data access is really part of the, the data accessibility to that A and the I within the, the FAIR principles. And then finally, I, I mentioned that National Data, uh, data Platform Pilot, uh, that and uh, Pelican in general and 28 other awards are part of a larger pilot uh, run by uh, the NSF called National Discovery Cloud for Climate. Or, or NDCC. Uh, so that aims to federate uh, NSS computing investments from really small institutions, maybe from CC star awardees uh, to the largest computing centers, it includes cyber infrastructure, it includes software, it includes uh, domain science. It kind of, it's a really a, a interesting vertical stack from the hardware uh, all the way up to people doing climate research itself. And uh, my goal is to have Pelican through the OSDF uh, deliver a platform that, that many others can build upon within the NDCC. So here I've highlighted a little bit uh, about how uh, NSF thinks about this and, and they say that resource will federate advanced compute data software and networking resources. And I have to admit as a the Pelican PI, I feel really at home and excited to, to work within this community. All right, and that's all for today. And happy to, to answer any questions. All right, well, thank you, Brian, for, for going through all that uh, really interesting stuff. So what I will do is I will allow people to unmute themselves if they certainly want to, to do so and ask a question. You can also raise your hand and I could acknowledge you, or you can still use the chat room. Uh, we can do it all, all of those different ways. So while we wait for a couple of questions to come in, I had just sort of jotted a couple down here. Um, 
you you said you're working with the climate community right now, and they certainly have very large and diverse data sets for for a lot of the things that they do. If you had to sort of scope this to a target community, somebody that would be adopting this, you know, uh, is it really sort of made for the big distributions or would sort of small instrument science or sensor science also fit into this? You know, is it scoped for everybody or does it work well for certain types of files and, and use cases? Yeah, I, 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 I think uh, the good use cases maybe don't uh, uh, align 100% with the, the science domain. Uh, you know, your, your example of climate science. So this is not uh, how you'd like to produce a, a huge climate simulation, right? You know, you you really want uh, something like Cheyenne uh, and, and that NCOR runs in Wyoming to do the, the petabytes upon petabytes of, of, of data crunching. Uh, but what we found is that that is a, a big, important use case in climate science, but there are also a lot of uh, kind of what they call medium sized or smaller data sets. And then also this will shine within uh, you know, places where there's repeated use. Uh, so like that NRAO example was an iterative process. Uh, machine learning often is uh, iterative process as you go through the, the, the epoch. So, um, you know, it, it, while we are working with climate researchers, it's, it's not that, you know, I, I don't want to go off and say, oh, this works for every single climate use case, there's still kind of the uh, use cases that we, we work to identify uh, with the users uh, that will run well on the infrastructure. Okay. Uh, Julio, you have your hand up if you want to go. Thanks, Jason. Hi, Brian. Hey. Great talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, you made a statement early in your talk that shared file systems can be the death of HTC. Can you yeah. can you explain that, please? Yeah. That so, is? so the there there's two reasons. One, um, I, I tend to view them as pretty brittle, uh, which which could be a, a a fair or or unfair statement. Um, but the the real for, for me the the real concern with shared file systems is it it provides a really opaque layer between the compute resource management planning infrastructure and the, the data delivery part. Uh, and by by having uh, the part that's orchestrating your workload understand the data requirements, uh, it, it can decide, you know, again, whether certain parts of the task need to run locally or can run anywhere in the globe. Uh, it, it can start to affect policy of, you know, you know, di distributed computing. You you're going to see errors more often, and you're you know that policy of when there's an error, have the upper layer know and reschedule, maybe execute somewhere else. If that data access is shoved down into a shared file system, uh, you can't have that policy layer really understand the failures that are happening, and then it just kind of dumps it onto the user. So so while it might have been uh, a little over dramatic to say it's the, the death knell of HTC workflows, uh, having that visibility and that tight linking uh, where you can have policy and uh, have the, uh, the, the data piece understood uh, on the overarching workflow layer is really powerful for uh, the, the distributed aspect of of the HTC, and I, I think it's one that really is going to help make users happy in the end, because uh, they're they're not going to be the ones that that uh, see all the errors and the issues. Okay, thanks. All right, thanks for the good question, Julio. Uh, I'll put out another call if anybody else has any things they'd like to ask, either raising hand or just unmuting or, or typing in. Um, so how long did you say that this uh, funding was going to be uh, lasting, Brian? Four years. Um, okay, so lots of time. It, you know, it, it seemed like a lot of time until I, I realized this month that uh, we're we're already ten percent through the project. <laughs> so, uh, you know, what are what do they say that the days are long and the years are short? Uh, 
we've got a lot we want to do uh, the, this first year. A lot is cleaning and starting new stuff. Uh, but I'm I'm also really excited about some of the, the upcoming years and activities where we're thinking about optimizing the system, managing things, uh, managing the caches. So somebody with a petabyte uh, workflow doesn't thrash your caches and thinking about uh, service selection and getting away from GOIP. I mean, there's just... Uh, a huge number of interesting research topics here. And uh, when I start writing down all the stuff I want to, to do, uh, four years is like tomorrow. <laughs> yep, certainly is. All right, well, I think that we may be done on questions. So uh, thanks again for, for the great talk, Brian. Uh, send along your slides. I'll make sure that they get posted. And for anybody else who's still listening, uh, we've filled in the schedule a lot. So uh, look for the email with updates on the next couple of talks. Uh, in particular, uh, Jen Shope is going to be giving uh, an overview of uh, some of the things that the EPIC project is going to be doing for CC Star. Uh, Wendy Huntoon is going to give uh, an overview of the actual CC Star solicitation uh, in the early part of March. And then we have a couple of other uh, uh, science talks on the Chameleon Project, and Kurt Dodds talking about some astronomy data, and the Personar Development Team is going to be offering some office hours as well. So uh, look for the schedule. I uh, hope everybody has a good week, uh, weekend, and good week next week, and we'll talk to everybody soon.